everyone, and welcome to the Kristen and Roman Show. My name is Kristen Brown, and this is... Roman Wyden. Welcome. And today we're going to be talking about a subject that a lot of people experience, and we're really hoping to bring some light and maybe a little levity to this subject, because it is something that, when I was reading in an article, Psychology Today, it was saying that this can be one of the most challenging things that a person goes through other than the death of a child. That's how they rated it. And for some people it can be. And since I am someone who has had two divorces, I'm here to tell you I had one that was cake and I had one that was not so cake. Yes, I hear you. And I am currently going through divorce. So I think we are in a way very qualified to have this conversation because you have a lot of experience and you can share from your past experiences. Whereas I can sort of report from the the battle front. And by battle, I don't mean battle as in I'm fortunate that it's a uh, an amicable uh, divorce, but what I mean is the emotional, right? What I'm going through on a daily basis or weekly basis, the inner battle is really more uh, what I'd like to share. And that's what we were going to, you know, we're going to talk about consciously, right? Consciously navigating a divorce. What does that mean to you, consciously navigating a divorce? Yeah. Consciously, that is such an amazing word because what I think of when I think consciously, I think of bringing everything up front to my prefrontal cortex, which means I am very aware of my behaviors, my thoughts, my choices and decisions. And I try to be more intentional within a certain energetic space during the divorce. And I remember doing this to my the difficult divorce, which we can get into a little later, but that's what consciousness consciously means to me. What about to you? Yeah, it's um, uh, the awareness, right? To have the awareness uh, to be so in the present moment and not to be hijacked by our resentments and our, our triggers and all the, the things that do come up, of course, that are definitely going to come up in a divorce you know in a divorce when you're talking about money you're not really talking about money you're talking about self-worth you're going back in the past and you're talking about resentments or i'm not good enough or you got more than i did you know it, there's just so much that comes up and to be aware of all of it and not be hijacked by it to me would be going through it consciously right and i was speaking to the divorce from my second husband that was you know the fight was on, put it that way. He was not going to rest until. And one of the things that I did to be very conscious going through that, because there was an abandonment involved. He left the family. He left me with all the things like I had stress up the yin, but I wanted to keep my energy sound. I wanted to keep me in a place that was as chill as possible, for lack of a better word. And in one of those things that I said to myself over and over and over again was, I don't want to screw him over. I want what's fair. And so by saying that, I kept putting that out into the universe. I just want what's fair. I just want what's fair. So that took what I call the fight out of it. I stopped trying to fight and trying to win because in my mind at that time, and anybody would probably agree if they knew the story, they'd be like, you deserve everything you know, take him to the bank, uh, you know, all these type of things. But I don't roll that way. And I didn't want to bring that energy into it. So I wanted to really be like super intentional with my choices during this. But what I first had to do was to calm my nervous system because it was on freaking fire. And we know that, you know, again, when there's an abandonment involved and I was not, I had given up my clientele during hair of uh, doing hair for 19 years, I had no means of income. We had a massive house I had to sell. I mean, I was virtually looking at homelessness because you client building up a hair clientele takes time. And so I was definitely in fight flight and I wasn't eating. I lost a bunch of weight and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't make any good decisions from this place. So one of the first things I did was really, really made intentional effort, conscious effort to calm my nervous system. And I did that through meditation and hiking and things like that. That's, yeah, that's great. And, and you know, it's so important to take care of ourselves first. And of course, it's the hardest thing to do when you're going through a divorce because there's there's your partner, uh, there's your, in, in my case, in your case too, there are kids, right? So it really forced me instantly to uh, look at everything in life. Like if I needed to take care of myself, it's like, well, can I? Is this selfish right now? 
or do I need really need to take care of myself and remove myself from this conversation or ask for space or go out of town for a weekend, right? And I'm going into some details, but the bigger picture of that is that, again, it's the awareness, the consciousness that you mentioned, right? To be so aware of what needs to be done moment by moment and what I have to show up for. And then what is a boundary well, where I need to set a boundary and say, actually, no, that's, I'm not going to do this or I, I can't do this right now, right? Whatever. We'll get into that some more, but I think there's there's nuances to this, right? Well, I want to add. Just, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go for it. No, go for it. No, if you weren't finished with your thought, it's okay. I was just going to say what you said is great because it's the self care that you know you take care of yourself first so you can show up for others in a healthy way, right? Oh my gosh, a hundred percent. And this is about prioritizing our our well being. And by the grace of God and the universe, I was not working at that time. And I can't even imagine what it would have been like trying to do my hair clients while I was in such a state, because it was a very, it was the scariest thing I'd ever gone through because I was, like I said, looking at being homeless with three children in tow. And I had these little innocent faces, the the most important beings in my life. And for the first time in my life, I, I was faced with maybe not being able to care for them. And that was like, absolutely annihilating to me. So my choice was I could either go down that pit of despair and fear, or I could start to rise myself out of that. And that's when I really had to prioritize my self-care, like do whatever it took. And a lot of times I would, like I said, I would head out to the mountain to go hiking and I would just pull over to the side of the road and sob. I just had to get all that energy out of my body. And I was like, is this okay? Because I didn't hike. And I was like, yes, if this is just all you needed, was a 30 minute drive to cry and let this out, then that's what you need to do. So I, I yeah. do agree that what you're saying, Roman, is so incredibly important. We must prioritize our well being because, like we all hear all the time, we don't have our oxygen mask on. We can't help those around us. <clears throat> so any healing that we do within or inside of ourselves, anything that we do that is loving towards self is going to bleed out into the world. But in this particular case, you know, there's a lot of, especially if there's kids involved, there's people relying on us and to make the right choices and decisions. And I recently heard a girl say that she had just gone through a divorce, but she had, she was suffering from narcissistic abuse. And if you've been through that, a person's been through that, they know that, man, you are like not yourself. Your brain is foggy. You can't think straight, all these type of things. And your person's in the room and it's been 15 years of this. And she said that she couldn't even speak to the judge. And she was feeling really bad about that. She was like, I didn't get anything. I, I couldn't talk. And the judge kept trying to get me to talk. And all I could do was cry. So this is why I really want to bring this to the forefront is, is, you know, we're not doing any good by wallowing in what's happening. It's so incredibly important to get intentional. And I want to add to, to take it slow and easy because so often we just want to rush through this stuff. Like this is, this is yucky. It feels gross. I just want to be away from this person I just want the separation. I want to go on about my life. And, you know, when is this going to be over? Especially in the case if it's somebody who's extremely difficult. And we can't rush this. We can't rush this. There's there's court dates. Go ahead. Speak on this, Roman. No, I was just uh, one of uh, my favorite songs came to mind. Um, it's called uh, Trevor Hall. It's called uh, You Can't Rush Your Healing. Mm. You know, and I listen to it probably every day uh, at, at different times. And it's so great what you said. I want to get to it. I just want to zoom out real quick and then get to, to that point, back to that point, is that, you know, in our society, because you mentioned the judge and, you know, legal system. And, you know, when we zoom out, a divorce is really just a relationship that's ending. If we can just look at it that way, there's so much negative stigma attached to a divorce. When, when you hear every time when I'm telling someone I'm going through a divorce, they go, oh, I'm so sorry to hear. And my answer now is like, thank you. And actually, we're creating it to be very amicable. So it's not a bad divorce. Because when people say divorces are bad, it's what they mean is bad divorces are bad. Yeah. Even for children involved. Yes, it's not ideal to have a divorce. I get that. Or a disruption in the family system. But a good divorce, and by good is what we're discussing here, is a consciously navigated divorce. In the end, I believe 
everyone will be fine, if not even better than fine, right? So just wanted to sort of pull out to that 10,000 foot view um, and getting back to, yeah, like I, I'm a big believer that you can't rush your healing. Like we probably, my still, I call it still wife because we're still legally married, uh, soon to be ex-wife. Um, there've probably been four or five times especially on her part, because I was the betrayer and she had betrayal trauma and like rightly so, uh, you know, she could have found agreement anywhere in the street, anywhere in the world of like, yeah, like F this guy go. Right. And I'm very fortunate that we're working it out together, but there's probably been four or five times when she was like, I just want this to be done. Let's just get it done with. I need this done. And at the time, it's not what we talked about, but now looking back, we both agreed that when emotions hijack us, that's what I said earlier, right? When we get hijacked by these strong emotions, we actually disregard the true responsibilities and the true, the things we have power over to create a peaceful divorce, especially when there's kids involved. I cannot stress this enough. And we, you and I talked about this. Kids are so important in this because parents, the adults, right? We get so hijacked by our emotions that we're just like lit literally willing to throw gasoline into the fire in front of the kids. Yeah. And we're justifying it by saying, yeah, because he's an asshole. Yep. And I always say, okay, let's say he's yeah. an asshole. Let's say he's a narcissist, right? Doesn't mean you have to forget and you have to stay there, but it is our duty as parents for our kids to kind of mitigate what's, you know, how much gasoline are you going to put into the fire? And, and we'll talk more about this, but I just wanted to stress that, that, you know, getting hijacked by our emotions is what makes divorces so ugly. And the, the, even the, the word divorce, I think we should come up with a new word in our, in our society, because let's face it, how many relationships, Kristen, you that you can think of, and this is kind of a trick question, there's probably not a number, but think about how many relationships have you completed in your life so far? Hundreds of them, probably. I don't mean romantic, but just any right. business, friends, yep. family members that passed away, that's a relationship that ends, right? Like there's, it's just, it's the nature of life. We start something and if it doesn't work out, we complete it, but it's how we complete it to yeah. me that makes a big difference. Yes, oh my gosh, you have said so much gold there. Like I really encourage anybody who's listening to rewind back to the beginning of that and re-listen to that because there was just so much gold in there. Backing up just a tad, the one thing that I say to people when they're like, yeah, I'm getting a divorce. My first question, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Like, yeah, because like, I'm not going to assume that I know what this means for that person. And even though divorces can be extremely difficult, sometimes they're the best decision that can be made, even with children. Because like Dr. Phil says, it's better to come from a broken home than a broken marriage. Because if all that strife and yuckiness is going on, I remember when my parents got divorced, which by the way, I don't even know how they got together. They're so different. But my mom's like, yeah, dad and I are getting divorced. And I said, oh, thank God. <laughs> like what the heck? You know, I was in my twenties, but, but my older brother didn't do that. He got really upset by it. He, he had a completely different viewpoint on it. So I also want to touch on the fact that you talked about focusing on the future. And that's something that I think is really important because yes, this sucks right now. This is hard. There's some hard decisions to be made. There's been, there's a lot of feelings involved, even with like you were saying, you were the betrayer, but I am sure there's things and I'm not assuming this, but even when the betrayer or the person that the perpetrator, whatever you want to call them that did the, the thing, we're not completely off the hook either. There's things that we did too. And the experience of the other person that they have of us. I mean, this is a mingling. This is a dynamic that created this divorce. And so it's not just one side, even though there might be an event that, that catapulted it, but you know, so one of the things that I feel is really good is when I say focus on the future, I mean, on the desired future. I mean, like this is going to be okay. This is all going to work out so successfully for all of us. Everybody is going to be happy at the end of this. And a lot of times people they're like, there's no way I, I'm wishing happiness on that bitch or that asshole. You know, they don't want to, to feel like that in that moment. And that's okay. Because it, sometimes we are carrying around a lot of unresolved emotions, a lot of unresolved feelings. However, again, when we're, when we're going back to 
energy. Everything that we put out comes back to us. We put out, it comes back to us. That is just the law of energy in the universe. That's how it works. What we put out, we attract back to us. And I know that I make enough of mistakes in my own life that I don't need to be attracting more crap to me. So I really want to sit in that space of, you know, I'm going to do the very best I can in this situation, regardless that this person betrayed or abandoned or did whatever they did. Yes, I was angry. Yes, there was moments that I had to pull over to the side of the road and scream and yell and curse them out with every sailor language I could possibly think of. And then, as I stated in my book, I said I repositioned myself to soldier on. So I felt the feelings, process, process through the feelings, allowed it to be anger because anger is okay. It's okay. It's just an emotion. It feels worse than it is. It's just an emotion. We just let that pass the same way that we would let any other emotion pass. So yeah. that's what the hijacked by emotions can really, really mess us up because if I'm focusing on, which I did, by the way, it, you know, I'm starting over again. This shouldn't be happening you know, all the things that were fighting the reality of what is, then I was keeping myself in a place of suffering. So I had to be, like I said, I went to the meditation practices. I mean, I would sometimes meditate for two hours at a time, literally just for deep breathing, just to try to get my heart rate to normalize because I was scared to death. And I will tell you, as I move forward through that, because I had a meditation practice in place, and no one told me to. This is just what I felt like I needed to do because I knew I was just like, you know. And that, looking back in hindsight, it was so incredibly helpful. In fact, the day, because we only could do a little bit in mediation, right? With the second husband, we couldn't come up with all the things because he's very money oriented and of course didn't want me to have anything and all of these things. So <clears throat> the day of the actual court, I have my head leaning back against the wall, sitting in my chair outside the courtroom and I'm meditating. And my attorney said to me, he's like, what, what are you doing? Are you okay? And I'm like, I just kind of cracked an eye open out. I'm like, I'm just meditating. And he was like, oh, I remember the look on his face, like what the bleep? Because I'm sure, I'm sure people are out there like, let's get them, you know, and they're all mad and all these things. But I wanted to really be able to hold my own. And then when I got on the stand, and I think this story is purposeful for people that can get in this place. Like I was talking about that gal earlier that just, you know, basically choked for lack of a better word on the stand. I got on that stand and I was in such a pace, place of peace that I was more in observance of this crazy situation that I found myself in. I'm like, I'm looking at the two tables and I'm looking at the judge and I'm like, I'm in, I'm in the stand, right? And his attorney was a piranha. He was treating me like I had committed murder. He was yelling at me. He was trying to get me to break. He was and I just answered the questions. And at one point he was trying to get me to do something else. And I just, I didn't know what he was asking. He, oh, he asked me if I was double dipping. I don't even know what that term means to this day. I don't even know what that means. And I looked at the judge and said, I'm sorry. I don't know what that means. And he just, he goes, just move on. Like stop harassing her. Mm -hmm. But I was so calm. And I did that because I was super intentional about me. And I was super intentional because like I said, everything was on the line with this. I was scared to death, even when I got the uh, the thing that told you, you know, what happened in the divorce. I was like shaking. I didn't even want to read. I had to read it three times to get what what yeah. it was all about. Well, uh, yeah, that's uh, brings up a really important point here. What you're talking about, so many great things you said, and I I see that the the court system or the sort of divorce system we have, especially in this country, right? I live here in the United States, so I'm going to speak for this country is really only exists around the divorce because of our lack of control of our emotions. Because if we were able to control our emotions or like let them come through, let them pass, and then really looked at what's so and what needs to be done. And this is a plug for our last episode, episode three on responsibility, mm. taking responsibility for your life, right? And if you haven't seen it, I uh, encourage you to, to watch that. So good. It's really about, you know, if people were responsible if they responded like, you know, powerfully to any scenario, we wouldn't need a court system around the worst because it would make sense what needs to be done here, right? It would, it would be common sense, but we get so blinded uh, by, uh, for lack of a better word, it's really, it's it's the triggers, right? It's our, our childhood wounds, right? It's the abandonment issue, the I'm not good enough, nobody loves me. 
And so if we can see our partner, not as the enemy or the end all of this, this life or this marriage, but really as a, and I know that I'm getting esoteric here, but as a, uh, a life coach, as a teacher that showed up in that moment uh, and, and that triggered this wound and that it's actually up to us to heal our own. To, like you said, you take care of yourself, self-care. You take care of yourself first and then you bring yourself more regulated to the table of any discussion, right? To me, then you can have a conscious divorce. And look, I, I'm i going through this with the mother of my boys uh, daily, weekly, right? It's becoming easier because at the beginning, we got so derailed by our emotions and she needed time to heal and I needed time to go through stuff. And we both were in different relationships at times and now, now we're not. And now we're actually really facing each other and we're really taking care of the divorce and we're moving it to the the finish line consciously and it's a whole different experience right but it, it takes time it does take time and this is why the word conscious is so important and why we titled it that because we're not going to knock it out of the park at the first try okay it's gonna it's going to take some time and me knowing that i if i were to sit in blame then i was in powerlessness so I wanted to reclaim my power and put myself back into the seat. I was no longer the victim of who was a narcissist. I mean, you know, and all the things had alcohol issues and cheating and all kinds of things. Like it was like the full Monty and physically abusive. Like there was a lot that went on there, but I did sit in that. I also started to change my, the narrative in my head to, I get to have a fresh start. Yes. I'm 42 years old, which is what I was at the time but I get to have a fresh start. I get to do things differently next time. I get to choose better for myself because yes, even though he was all of these things, the truth be known is that I attracted him. And two weeks in when he was starting to show signs of this, I ignored it. And so I am equally as responsible to this outcome because I consciously participated in these behaviors instead of removing myself from these behaviors. So you know, I really wanted to take responsibility for that. But there's something that I really want to bring up that I think is so incredibly important. And that is to first, like the, the number one thing I believe that we need to do, number one above anything else is to secure and stabilize the children. I think this is so incredibly important because my first kids, my, my first kids, my first two kids, my oldest two kids, that were the only ones alive, not my third one. When I went through my first divorce, they literally have said to me, we never felt like the product of divorce. It, they never, like to this day, they have zero weird divorce trauma because of the way their father and I handled it. And we went on to, to stay really good friends for 10 years and do things together. And um, even with new partners and things like that, but we were very intentional about how we handled it. And they never suffered the consequences of that. And we worked together even after the fact, okay? Because sometimes they'd go to his house and he wasn't great at certain things and he would call me and he's like, I think they just need to come home to you. And I'm like, okay. You know, we, we just worked together for whatever it was that the kids needed at the time. But most importantly, I feel this has to be like the holy grail of holy grails. Like this has to be, it is that this is not their problem, okay? They are little innocent bystanders between two adults not being able to work something out. They are not to be used as pawns and they're not to be used as um, you trying to feed your ego and trying to be right by telling the child that your, your, their mother or their father is an a-hole. Okay. That doesn't do any good. And trust me when I tell you people, this was not easy for me because I had a lot of anger. I had a lot of freaking anger. And I just wanted to say, do you hear that? You know, and, but I, I kept it from them all. In fact, they didn't know. And later in life, it's interesting. His daughter, my 18-year-old, almost 18-year-old said to me, she's like, wow, mom, looking back, she goes, what you went through and how we, I was, we were clueless. She goes, you went, because now she knows what I teach and she knows my book and all these things. And she's like, we, we were clueless. That's, she goes, that was, that must have been really hard. Mm. Like she was so empathetic to what I went through, but she was grateful that I didn't pull her into it. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. And and I think that's, again, a great example. Like you said, um, kids don't have to be 
product of a divorce if it's a conscious divorce. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a big believer that you can't trauma proof anyone, nope. any child. If you're listening out there, you're a parent, you have a new child. Let me just burst that bubble. Every child will have a trauma, multiple traumas. I mean, all of them, multiple traumas. They could be small. They could be big. We don't know. It's hard to control it. Uh, when we start to try to control it is when we start to really go overboard. And, you know, that's a whole nother story. But so that said, traumas or these events in life are only, in my opinion, let's call it bad for, for a human uh, if there's no support structure to move through them, right? And what you shared is beautiful because yes, you got a divorce and there's kids, right? But you guys carried them through with as much love and as much peace as you can. Was it perfect? No. Was there still a divorce? Yes. Do the kids maybe still need therapists in the future? Possibly. Look, we're all going to benefit from therapy and workshops and all that in the future anyway. So that said, I, I just want to stress to parents listening, or if you're going through a divorce, like really make it the best possible experience first for your children. And then you'll realize when you do that, you're almost forced to make it a better experience for yourself and your still partner, right? And in the end, everybody wins. If it's a nasty divorce, and this is kind of a side joke, if you're out there dating and you're going out with people who are divorced or in the middle of a divorce, and it's a nasty divorce, I would say stay away from that person. If you're serious to have a relationship with someone, if they're going through a nasty divorce, it says a lot about not just the relationship they had, but themselves. Because like you said, I'm a big believer, and this is nothing to do with victim shaming, but, or and, that when we are in a nasty divorce, we've attracted that per You can never attract anybody more healed than you. You've heard me say this many times. So it shows where you're at. No judgment. It's not good or bad. It's just unless you want that drama in your life, stay away from people who are going through nasty divorces. That's a little side dating advice, but, and I've I had to learn that. my own lesson, you know? Huh? Well, and you know, it looks differently. Like you said, when you, we can't attract people to us that are any more healed than we are, people might be like, what do you mean? This person right. cheated or they're a narcissist or they gaslight. Okay, well, their level of energy is directly to yours. They may be narcissistic, but you might be a doormat. I mean, yeah. there's always there's always a level of attraction energy there. Always, always, always. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that anybody's more right than the other. Although some things, some behaviors, yeah. being a doormat's not going to land you in jail, but spousal abuse will, right? So yes, there's there's right. different layers to this that we could go into. Yeah. Yeah, energetically, I, I agree with what you said, right? You can never, it's kind of like I always picture the International Space Station. You can't dock with someone unless you're energetically aligned. And that could mean that one of them is a narcissist, the other one's a people pleaser or a doormat, right? And it doesn't mean there one isn't better than the other. They're both unhealed wounds that need attention. And by blaming the other person, we're actually deflecting the energy that could point to us, oh, we, I, I should look at this, I should heal this. Oh, no, but it's his fault. So then we actually, and we, I think we live in a society that allows people nowadays easily to point the finger and deflect their, like distract from their own work and go, yeah, but he was an asshole or he was a, a betrayer, right? A cheater. Yes. So, so therefore there's nothing over here to look at. It was him, right? That's robbing yourself of the opportunity to look at that unhealed wound and do the work. And that's where the that's where the beauty comes from. Because once that's healed, right? Now you go out with a different energetic frequency. Now you can attract someone that's also healed a major wound. And now you're in a really kind of, you know, compatible healthier. relationship. Yeah. Much healthier place for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I would like people to maybe look at it like this, that, you know, as soon as, and, and someone might find this hard to swallow and that's okay. I'm just offering this for anybody that might want to pick it up. The healing journey is that like, as soon as you're separated physically, the healing journey can start. It, it can even start within a relationship, but I'm not going there. I'm just saying that, you know, we're talking about divorce here. And as soon as there's that little bit of separation, your healing journey can start. However, we will attract the same type of things to us if we're not willing to do the work to attract something differently to us, like you were talking about. 
which was the case with me because after I was, you know, in all my old previous relationships prior to that, I was like, well, they had this, 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 and this. So their fault, I'm fine. I'm going to move on. And I am a good person. And I knew that, but some of these people were too. They just had some unhealed wounds, but I would just move on without doing any work. And I would always attract the same type, some iteration of the same type of thing, same type of relationship. It just looked a little bit differently. And I was like, after that, my tsunami divorce is when I said, all right, I keep attracting this. And now this was like the boulder to the head wake up call. Like you're, you're gratefully, I wasn't homeless. You know, my parent, my mother and my stepfather invited us to go stay with them. However, like this is how bad it got. It doesn't have to get to that stage for me to wake up and say, I'm the common denominator here. So in saying all of this, because this is about divorce, what I'm saying is that to sit in the, in the, in the, the victimhood of it and that is the energy that is going to keep us stuck and low. But knowing that we can move forward from this, that there is going to be better on the outside of this. Life doesn't end. This is just another challenge that is coming on. It sucks right now. I understand. However, when you can look at, like I said, the desired future, like after this, I'm when I'm through with this, I am going to start afresh. I'm going to start healing myself. I'm going to look at the places inside myself that I sabotaged myself. I'm going blah, 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 all the unhealed wounds. You know, that one little thought I was a doormat. Maybe I need to start investigating that, or I know I'm a people pleaser or a codependent or whatever it might be. Just knowing that, you know, start that now. Again, looking back at him and and wanting to make him wrong just kept me in such a bad place. I just yeah. wanted to look at the future and what this could mean. And keep my children secure by keeping them out of this as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you brought up a great, thank you for bringing that separation, right? You brought up that word. So I recently had this, not an insight, but I've been sort of, as I'm going through a divorce, uh, we've been separated for two and a half years, right? And what, two things I got. First of all, I think as a society, we don't actually utilize separation the right way. The way we utilize it or look at it is like, oh, hell yes, I'm out of this marriage. I'm now, let's say you go, you know, the husband or wife or partner goes and rents a place somewhere. And now you're physically out, right? And now for most people, it's party time. Yep. It's catching up on sex. It's dating. It's because what kicks in is this, uh, this almost this fear of like, am I still attractive? Am I still wanted? Am I still loved? Right. Um, Especially if there was betrayal, the other partner, the betrayed partner might be like, well, F you, I'm going to, I'm going to prove that I'm still loved and I can still get laid and I'm still pretty, right. whatever. Right. So we're using separation almost like the next step to then get divorced. And I know that's what it is, but I thought, what if we used it kind of like what you were describing? It's like a timeout. It's a timeout where you actually individually start doing the healing work. And here's my second point that feeds into this. What I've realized, and I learned the hard way, the hard way meaning it was in a very strong emotional uh, challenge and lesson that I've gone through and still am going through, is don't jump into the next relationship right away. And I know we hear this all the time from people and we're like, yeah, yeah, I know, whatever, I know. And I thought I knew, right? Sort of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yep. Well, I did. I jumped into a relationship and it was a very intense relationship and I fell in love and it was just uh, eventually realizing it was not compatible for a long-term, long-run relationship. And besides that point, to jump into something new without doing the healing work, right, robs us of this amazing opportunity. Like you said, if you if you can look at your own wounds, like find your part in it, right? How come this went wrong? Like wrong, meaning how come this is ending? What's my part? And really do the work with a therapist or be in a 12-step program if you're a codependent person or a sex and love addict, you know, really, really just go and dig, become a detective of your own life, at least for a year, take a year off, right? Use that separation as your healing space. Because sometimes I believe some marriages can still work out after that, right? If both people do the work. Yeah. And- if not, at least you're now aware that, oh, this was my 
my part in it. This is my pattern. I don't want to repeat that. So I'm going to heal and transform that. And then eventually I might, might be in another relationship. So I just wanted to say that because separation for people is like, yeah, 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 I'm separated. Now I'm going to party and get divorced. And then I'm going to jump into a new relationship and that one will be better. Eh. No, big ant. Eh. You nailed it because that's what a lot of people do. Like, I'm free. I'm free. I can go do whatever I want. And you know, all those places that you think you couldn't, now they think that's what they're, you know, they're going out there and they're yeah. just free willing it all over the place. And a lot of people are going to seek to fill that void because now they're alone and people are, get uncomfortable being alone. And this is something that I did after my tsunami X is I... I had been in a relationship since 15 years old, all the way up until the, that divorce, except for one year when I was 20 to 21 and another year, I couldn't tell you third, between the one and two uh, marriages. That's it. Other than that, I was yeah. in long-term relationships the whole, in, whole time. And I was like, okay, I need to be alone for a while. Not only to, you know, I was starting on the healing journey. The whole point was to not repeat the pattern, but the other part was I need to get comfortable being alone. Because even in those two years, those two separate years that I was single, guess what I was doing? I was I was searching. I was trying to find somebody else to fill that void. Yeah. So when we are on the mad hunt, and I'm going to call it what it is, desperate, that's really what it is. It's, it's an unrecognizable desperation that maybe I don't exist if I don't have somebody showing me that I do. So I, or to fill the void or to tell me that I'm wonderful, or to make me feel loved or whatever it might be. That's a scary position for a lot of people. And so I got to get that boyfriend. I got to get that girlfriend. Okay. But when we can really get comfortable being alone, the, the most amazing things can happen in that aloneness. And in my first book, I called it aloneness equals re recreation, like recreation, but mm. re hyphen creation time. I love yeah, it. Kind of clever, huh? And yeah. <laughs> because that's what it was. It was it's recreation, but it's recreation. I looked at it like that. And I did not date. And I'm the first person to tell people in the grand scheme, in the big picture, but without being absolute, I will say I would never recommend somebody dating somebody going through a divorce. Never yeah. recommend that because, like you said, there's too many variables, too many things, too many unhealed unhealed stuff that's going on. However, I will say this, there's a small, tiny caveat. And I'm even scared to say it because people might want to run with this. I have seen where people have been in 30 year marriages and they were just sucking it up to get along, get the kids through college or whatever. But in the meantime, they were doing their own personal healing. They were healing within the marriage. And then it came to the point where it was just a matter of signing papers and moving on yeah. and a couple other little loose ends, emotional loose ends. But I've seen those people move on to have healthy relationships, but it's rare. Right. It's, it's rare. rare. And, and what you said, I a hundred percent agree and support that like dating somebody who's separated or going through divorce or still not divorced. Right. Um, in most cases, I would bet my money, my life on it, that it's a bad idea because most of us are not, you know, healed enough to, to um, not get hijacked by our emotions. And most of us, you can't control what the, the new partners soon to be X, what they're doing. Right. And there's such a emotional, there's a frenetic energy in it. And then there's also this emotional sort of like eggshell walking that could change the, the tide could change turn any day, any moment. Right. And I've seen it in my, when I was in a relationship while I was separated, um, you know, I thought it was fairly stable and doable and fun and this is going to work out and we're going to make it work. And I realized that I was totally checked out from my kids. I was checked out from actually being responsible in the divorce and doing what I needed to do. And I was also checked out to, to really be there for the mother of my children to understand her betrayal trauma and to show up lovingly and to not run from that, not be like, Hey, I'm out. I'm out. I'm having a good time. I'm out. Right. And now that I've been facing that for at least a year, it's almost a year, uh, things have dramatically shifted. I mean, what a, 
I'm so grateful. What, what a blessing to be in an amicable divorce with somebody who is willing to do the work and is willing to have grace and love and understanding with me in it, right? Who would have every reason to be like, F this guy, I'm out. I'm taking everything, I'm out. Um, and that was only possible because I finally, you could say, really separated for a year. I was really just on my own doing the healing work. And I'm going to continue to do that. I have no interest in in dating. I have not dated since my last relationship. I, I don't plan to find another partner because that's not what it's about right now. Yeah. What, it, what, what everything is about right now is, is healing the wounds that my last partner and my soon-to-be ex-wife are pointing at right? In their sort of life teacher kind of way. Now is the time because if not, I'm going to repeat the same shit again. Absolutely. Going back to the date, that was so good. Roman, everything that you said right there was just so good. So good. When I'm going back to the dating aspect and I don't want to be someone's distraction from pain and their healing and processing through their emotions of their former partner. So I think about the one person that I talk about in my book that I call Jacob, that I dated briefly, did not know he was still married. He told me he was divorced. First night I met him, he said he was divorced for three years. And it turns out he was just not living with her for three years. And then the divorce, I kind of was the catalyst for him to get the divorce. And then he started that, but then he starts getting the divorce and then I'm out. So there was, my point is, I don't want to be a distraction. I don't want to be the reason. I don't want to be any of those things. If a person thinks you're coming in and you're going to save somebody who's going through a divorce, that your love is so special that you're going to fix somebody, you're delusional. And I say that with so much love because- yeah. This person has their own wounds and things that they have to do on their own time, in their own space, in their own journey. And we wow. can't fix, facilitate, yeah. make it happen faster. And trust me when I tell you, no human's love is great enough to heal another person's wounds. It's an inside job. I love that. I mean, that was that right there was like mic drop because that's that's what I went through. Like I was trying to save or change my last partner, you know. Um, it was a distraction from my divorce. Yeah. And not to say in those instances, the reason why I think it's really we need to be really cautious because in my case, I did fall in love, you know. That's what made it so hard to then let go of that relationship. Yeah. I really did fall in love. And when we fall hard like that, and we're so in it and enmeshed and codependent and obsessed and addicted, like in my case, uh, it's really, really hard to get out of that and get back to the self and get back to the solitude, right? I had to claw myself or it's yes. like climbing out of quicksand, right? And so I totally, when you said that, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, to be someone else's distraction uh, during a divorce, uh, we both did that at the time. My partner and I, we both had similar scenarios and we sort of leaned on each other and for different reasons, but it's just not constructive to create a new healthy relationship. The wisdom that I would give to people now is that I want a person that's free and clear from that, that they've done, that they've done the best they can. Now, are we always hundred percent healed? No. Can partners help facilitate that in each other? They can help a little bit. Yes. You know, especially if if one's conscious and the other one really wants to be, yes, that that can that can happen. But unless or until, it's just going to muddy the waters and make things very very complicated. So I really invite people to not just jump into something else. It's right. not healthy and it's confusing AF for the kids because yeah. all of a sudden mom and dad are gone and now there's this new person now. I did date after my first divorce fairly soon, but I didn't bring people around because I didn't know if they were going to stick. Thank you, God. I had the wherewithal to know that I don't know if this is a thing. I don't know if this is going to stick, if it turns into something important, but I did not bring them around. Or if I did, it was one thing. I remember bowling once with my friend, right? That was it. And yeah. that they don't know who the person is. And that was it. It was nothing weird. But other than that, I really wanted to keep those things separated because 
it's really only the wounded part of us that really wants to fill that void really quickly. Okay. Yeah. And then now have I seen that other people have someone come in and really help them get through things? I've seen it, but again, it's all about energy. And if you're, if you're going in and this person really hasn't done the work that I believe is a requirement of this journey, I believe it's why we're here <clears throat> is to do this type of healing work. Only then are we going to be able to attract somebody who's really there in a healthy way. Yeah. And nothing or no one can fill that void, you know, other than us, I believe creating a spiritual connection to source, right? Connecting our, reconnecting ourselves, like you said, recreating ourselves, reconnecting ourselves back to source where love flows and nothing or no one else can fill that void. And, you know, many of us find that out the hard way. Many of us get to be 70, 75 and realize, oh, I've been running from my past and I've been trying to numb out with alcohol, drugs, sex, another partner, food, whatever, right? Gambling, cars, houses. And we realize that's not it. You know, that void, I have to heal my wound and fill the void of the self-love, right? Yeah. There's no, no one can do the, can do the work for us, like you said. I want to put an expl expl exclamation point. That's a hard word for me. <laughs> Ex explanation is I always want to say exclamation point on that, because this is the book that I wrote. You know, this was the first book that I wrote and my very first chapter, I won't hold it up to the camera is called connect with your divinity. It is chapter one. And when I laid out this the chapters of this book, I only picked up that chapter, connect with your divinity. I said, that's number one. And I picked up the rest and however they fell is how they went into the book. Wow. But the most important thing was to connect with my divinity, to return to that God self, that higher self, that healed self, the light part of me. Roman, I want to go jump into in a little bit of the remaining time that we have about the grief and the loss that's involved, yeah. because this is a thing. Yeah, thank you um, for bringing that up because I I think you're right. That is a huge part. Um, pain, right? Go, moving through divorce. I just want to acknowledge anyone. I have a new respect for people going through a divorce. Anyone going through a divorce, like I can't relate because I don't know your specific circumstances, but I get it. I I feel for you. It's challenging. It's so heavy on life on our lives, right? And then yes, there's the grief, like grieving that relationship, letting go of somebody for, in my case, 20 years, right? That's a long um, time. Grieving. I'm still grieving a relationship I had uh, during separation that was only eight months long, right? But because when we're in love or when we're really connected to somebody, it takes time to grieve. And yes, moving through that, allowing ourselves to move through those phases of the stages of grief, right? The sadness, the anger, um, has to be felt. It can, again, can't rush your healing, right? I've learned the, the hard way. I thought I was done. I'm done. I'm done. When am I done? Done, done. No. Got to pull over, like you said, on the side of the street and cry. You got to go sleep all day. You got to do that, right? You got to go to your therapist. You got to go to a 12-step meeting, take a bath. It's going to take as long as it's going to take. Yeah. It's a loss. It feels weird. It's sort of free falling because you're used to having that other person and no matter how dysfunctional it is, it feels like some degree of safety, having that other person in our life, in our house, that person that is supposed to be there when we get a flat tire on the side of the road, no matter what, because they're our partner, you know, these type of things take care of us if we're sick. And all of a sudden we, that's not there. Now, sometimes we didn't even have that. I'm not you know, we got to be loose with this right now. Okay. Cause there's a lot of variables. There's a lot, everybody's got a different story, but there is a loss. And I will say that even after my tsunami ex, that was, it was, I was okay with him going because it was so dysfunctional. But I remember Roman really mourning the loss of the dream because I was kind of wrecked for about 21 days. And I'm not even going to actually, I'm going to take back the word about it was 21 days. And I'll tell you why. But during that time, I remember being going, really going within and searching my feelings and searching my heart and saying, is it him? 
what, what am I feeling? Cause I felt sadness and grief and fear and all these things. And I go, no, it's not him. Cause it wasn't him that I had lost feelings for that during the relationship. That's why when he called and said, I'm gonna move out when I get home, I said, okay, I got it. However, it was the dream. It was the dream. Mm. Like, okay, second marriage, this time I'm going to get it right. We have a, a new little beautiful baby. We have this gorgeous home. I helped him build his career. We had talked about retirement. I mean, you know, all of these things and how it's all going to look. And then all of a sudden that was gone. It's like someone said, yeah, that's bullshit and threw it in the fire. And I'm sitting here going, you know, I remember really allowing myself to feel through those because it was the dream of how this was going to look, how it was going to end for me, how life was going to be. And I had to sit with that and sit with that. And then one day I didn't deny it. I didn't get rid of it. I didn't distract it. Uh, in fact, I'm going to show this part. I'm not a drinker. I was a little bit of a drinker then, but not a lot of a drinker. And I remember being so incredibly nervous and waking up at three o'clock in the morning, these type of things that I went, he was a drinker. So he had these high octane beers. I don't know what they're called. They're high, high alcohol content beers. Mm -hmm. And I, and they were out in the outside garage fridge. And I went and I got, I'm going to just drink a beer. And I drank one of his high octane beers. And within 10 minutes, I, I felt great. I felt amazing. The next day I was more sad. I was more scared. It was like that depressant brought me down even more. Yeah. It, it made me, so I'm just going to tell people, be mindful of the substances that you're using to numb during this because they can amplify your problem big time. <clears throat> yeah, that's but at, at day 21, I remember I woke up one day and I just was like, I feel great. I thought I was like back to Kristen. I was back to old me so much. So there was such a marked difference from those last three weeks that I looked at my calendar. I'm like, okay, he moved out on this date. I counted the weeks. I was like, it's been 21 days. There was 21 days before I got over him but, or the grief of the relationship, because I was willing to, yeah. I was willing to turn this around and say something better is coming. This is happening for me, not to me. I'm learning from this experience. I can now design an even better future. I still didn't quite get it with this person. I didn't still quite get that dream. Now I'm getting another opportunity at that dream. So instead of, you know, really, instead of just mourning, eh, I'm not going to have that anymore. I was like, well, what now I can redesign the whole thing. So it, it, this is about consciousness. This is about yeah. really consciously guiding ourselves through this. We can choose the, back to, the, the path of victimhood and sadness and grief and longing. And I'm never going to have another relationship, which is what a lot of people think is that I'm never going to find another person. Or, you know what? I get to start over and do the whole thing again and be fresh with new ideas and new healed, new healing. Yeah. And I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think if, if I have any closing thoughts or final thoughts around this is that the divorce and that includes a separation is really here for us to feel and heal right to to have these emotions come up not be hijacked by them but actually process them heal them whatever that looks like for you it might be just time or therapy or yoga or everything or meditation and prayer whatever works for you right but they're really here for us to heal something and not to blame someone else and then jump into the next relationship because the, the thing's going to repeat. And then we become these kind of people that, that point the fingers at others and say, well, it's, it's that person's fault. That person triggered me. It's more like, well, what did they trigger? Let's look at that. Why don't you look at that instead of blaming them because they triggered you, right? So I would just say uh, one thing I've learned is, yeah, like really take care of myself, like come to the table as healthy and as, as regulated as you can to every moment of the divorce, every moment with my boy's mom, every moment with my boys, come as regulated as I can or remove myself and say, I need some space. I need two hours. You know, I'll be back. I'm irritated. Let me, mm -hmm. right. That can cause a, you know, a conscious divorce. That's how you navigate a divorce consciously is moment to moment, show up as regulated and as healthy as you can be. And I guarantee you it's going to go well. I love that, Roman. <clears throat> I love that so much. Earlier before you said, I wonder if we can come up with another term for divorce. And I, you've probably heard of this book. I don't even know who wrote it. 
it, if you said the author, I'd probably remember. I have not read this book, but it's called Conscious Uncoupling. Have you heard it of that was, book? Wasn't it, uh, wasn't it Gwyneth Paltrow and her ex-husband who kind of created the term? Wasn't her writing it probably? But... No, she didn't write the book, but she adopted it. Yeah, her wow. and, and okay. Chris Martin from Coldplay, I think. Yeah. So yeah, I, I love that. And my my in closing, I would say that it's just three things. There's three things. And one, the fir very first thing is to prioritize your well-being. Okay. We got to prioritize our well-being. We got to, we got to go within. We got to be our own best friend, our own cheerleader, our own advocate. We got to be our own caregiver, nurturer, protector, any of the things. Because the one thing I haven't talked about is that really, if you need to have a very minimal time with a person, then you need to be able to honor that. If you need somebody to be the transfer person between picking up the kids from ex former spouse and bringing them back to you, you do that. Whatever you need to prioritize your well being, because sometimes these these are very toxic. Sometimes they're very very difficult. And I think the better you is going is going to be for your children. And that's the second thing is to secure the children. And this, these all kind of go hand in hand together. You know, securing the children, stabilizing the children, making sure that their well being is priority as well. Your well being and their well being, because oxygen mass first, they'll be they'll be okay for it. Do not involve them. They're not pawns. We understand that their little hearts, their little brains, they are not fully formed and they cannot, their brains, not their hearts, their brains cannot wrap their head around what this is. They see very black and white and, and their brains are taking in so much information at this time and the ego is starting to judge it. And a lot of times it's turning it around on us. So children will blame themselves if we're not careful. Well, mom's mad at dad, but the last fight they had was because I left my shoes on the, on the, the couch. It's my fault. See what I'm saying? So we've yeah. got to be super mindful about how we handle that. And the third thing is slow and easy, slow and easy. This too shall pass. You know, one of the, the smallest little phrases that has so much punch, this will pass. It's going to pass. It's going to get in your rearview mirror eventually. So you can choose to really suffer through it or really try to move through it consciously. Yep. And there is no cutting something and it's over. It's really untangling and unraveling and figuring it out and working through it, which takes time. Yes, it does. Amen. So for anybody who has listened all the way through this episode, I highly encourage you to click the subscribe button. Don't forget to give us a like and leave us a comment on whoever channel you are listening from. Roman and I are really two individuals who have dedicated ourselves to talking about the hard things, the real topics, the things that a lot of people want to skirt around. And, you know, some, some of the topics aren't, but we want to bring to it our own personal flair and our own experiences in a very vulnerable and real way because I believe people learn from stories and I believe people are encouraged and validated through stories and their experiences. So my hope always to anybody who's listening, if you've picked up one sentence, whether it was from me or from Roman, it doesn't matter. One sentence that makes you go, hmm, and makes you see life a little differently and maybe send you down a little bit different trajectory, then that is what my hope that, that you all will gain from this podcast. And we're really hoping to bring some light to this subject because as Roman was, as Roman was, ex we're talking about divorce, damn it. I want to yeah, start over. Two. I want to start over. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Take two. Yeah. You now I'm laughing, Roman. Now you got me laughing. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> do you want me to lead it? Oh, my God. No, no, you do. Oh, my God. Here we go. Take two. Ready? <laughs>